The state of South Carolina is home to some of the most fascinating and diverse wildlife on the planet. Its varying geographic regions host a variety of ecosystems, each providing the necessary ingredients for life to flourish and grow. Just as remarkable are the people whose mission is to protect and ensure that these fragile habitats continue to thrive. Now, it's time to learn and discover what's wild. Hello, I'm Desiree Cheeks, and today we're in the Carolina Sandhills, a fading ecosystem that serves as a sanctuary to numerous threatened animal and plant species. One thing to remember when traveling in the Sandhills is you have to be careful where you step. In this episode of What's Wild, we'll be taking a deep dive into some of the state's most vulnerable animals. But first, let's see what type of animal calls burrows like this one home and how a team of organizations are getting down and dirty to help with their survival. Turtles and tortoises are amongst the oldest living animals on Earth. With a history dating back over 200 million years, it's not surprising to see these ancient creatures appear in different myths and legends around the world. Their unique shell, also known as a carapace, symbolizes protection, while their long lifespan is often associated with longevity and wisdom. But behind the folklore lies a deeper tale of resilience and persistence. In the modern world, they face difficult challenges. Pollution, habitat loss, and poaching make up the underlying threats to turtle and tortoise populations. Conservation is now more important than ever to keep these essential species around to maintain the delicate balance they provide for their ecosystems. In South Carolina, one conservation project is helping to tip the scale for one of the most remarkable tortoises. Turtles and tortoises are both reptiles, and they may seem familiar at first glance, but there are several significant differences between them. Turtles are aquatic creatures that spend most of their time in water, either in rivers, lakes, or the ocean. Their webbed feet, and in some cases flippers, allow them to swim and maneuver in the water with ease. In contrast, Tortoises are land-dwelling turtles that inhabit dry, arid environments such as deserts and grasslands and have sturdy, elephant-like legs that are adapted for walking on land. All tortoises are a type of turtle, but not all turtles are tortoises. Turtles and tortoises are both oviparous, meaning that they lay eggs outside of their bodies rather than giving birth to live young. They hatch with their shells already developed, and while they grow, they shed their specialized exterior plates called scoots. They both also serve a critical role in their environments. As herbivores, tortoises help to maintain plant growth by consuming foliage and seeds. Turtles, on the other hand, are a crucial part of aquatic ecosystems, feeding on small animals and plants that help to maintain a healthy balance of diverse wildlife. However, there's one tortoise found in the Carolina Sandhills that goes beyond helping its habitat, and it does so in one of the most fascinating ways. Contrary to its desert-like appearance, the Sandhills ecosystem has a diverse array of plant and animal life. One resident here, the gopher tortoise, has one of the dirtiest jobs. The gopher tortoise gets its name from its burrowing behavior. In fact, the scientific name for the gopher tortoise is Gopherus polyphemus, polyphemus meaning cave dweller. This species creates deep burrows in the sandy soils, which can be up to 40 feet long and 10 feet deep. 
These burrows are used for shelter and for regulating body temperature, as they provide a cool and stable environment in the hot southern climate. A gopher tortoise uses its powerful front legs and sturdy nails to excavate its burrow. From there, the tortoise will dig out a tunnel where it will spend up to 80% of its life, only emerging to forage for food, bask in the sun, or to mate. The gopher tortoise is considered a keystone species in its environment, meaning that its presence is crucial for the survival of many other species in the same habitat. The burrows created by the gopher tortoise provide shelter for over 350 different species, including snakes, lizards, and other small animals that desperately count on the tortoise's burrow for survival. The Sandhills, like many areas, have been subjected to significant habitat loss over the past century. Historically, the longleaf pine forests of the Sandhills were heavily harvested for their timber, and much of the cleared land was developed for agriculture. In addition to the loss of forested land, the Sandhills region has also been impacted by habitat fragmentation. Habitat fragmentation occurs when large, continuous areas of habitat are broken up into smaller, isolated patches. When habitats are fragmented, species are often unable to move between the patches, which can result in decreased genetic diversity and alter the ecosystem's balance. For this reason, many species of plants and animals, like the gopher tortoise, are considered threatened or endangered. Since 2006, a conservation partnership between the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, the Longleaf Alliance, and the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources has been a commendable effort aimed at restoring the gopher tortoise population in the Sandhills ecosystem. In the beginning, the team started with around 50 tortoises sourced from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and wildlife rehabilitation clinics from around the state. These 50 were introduced to a site containing only eight adult tortoises. The project's primary objective is to build a self-sustaining gopher tortoise population with waif tortoises, or tortoises with no known origin or home. But to do that, released tortoises must first establish site fidelity to ensure that they don't leave the property. This process involves several components to successfully complete. First, a pen is constructed around a large plot of land ideal for the tortoise's growth and well-being. This provides an area that is safe for the tortoise to feed, socialize with other gopher tortoises, and more easily integrate into their new colony. Then, Cohorts of hatchlings, juveniles, and adults are introduced to the enclosure. To help newcomers, starter burrows are painstakingly dug by hand, giving tortoises multiple options and places to hide until they get settled and choose where to begin the strenuous work of creating a suitable home. Once a pen reaches capacity, the pen is kept in place for at least one year, after which research shows that they are now far more likely to stay and integrate into the population. Once the pen is removed, the tortoises are free to roam the entire property. Each tortoise is identified by a series of numbers or markings made on their scoots, giving scientists a way to monitor individuals and collect useful data. In the hot summer months, the dedicated team searched the pens to collect something else. Tortoise eggs. Between May and July, eggs are deposited in nests located at the burrow's entrance. Aha! They found one! 
A clutch will typically consist of three to nine eggs. The team is careful not to roll or jostle them because the embryo can easily be disturbed and not survive. A quick and painless pencil marking will help ensure they remain upright. From here, the eggs will be transported to the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Lab to be incubated and hatched so the process can start over again. Because of the novelty of the idea, doubts were understandably raised that a project like this could ever work. But since its inception, 17 pins and over 380 tortoises have been given a chance to play their vital role within the environment. This team's success thus far has shown that it can indeed function and serve as a model for future conservation efforts, keeping the gopher tortoise around for generations to come. Next up, we're heading to the upstate to find some of the most ecologically important furry flyers in the skies and how conservation might be the only thing saving them from a devastating disease. South Carolina is home to some of the most diverse ecosystems and wildlife in the United States. But when the sun sets on the Palmetto State, a remarkable world unfolds and begins to take flight. Bats reign as the silent guardians of the night, playing a vital role in maintaining the region's ecological harmony. However, their existence is not without challenge. In this balance lies a shadow in the form of a devastating disease. But amidst the darkness, a glimmer of light comes from organizations and everyday people trying to make a difference. Through tireless research and backbreaking efforts, these heroes of the environment strive to protect and conserve these vital members of South Carolina's natural beauty. And they do so in some of the wildest ways. Out of the 47 species of bat in the United States, 14 are found in South Carolina. With few exceptions, bats are nocturnal creatures emerging from their roost at twilight. Bats hold a special place in the animal kingdom as the only mammals capable of true flight. With astonishing agility, they can reach speeds of up to 100 miles per hour and soar as high as 10,000 feet. Though some bats feed on nectar and fruits, around 70% of bat species are insectivorous, subsisting primarily on a diet of insects. A single bat can consume an impressive 15 mosquitoes in just 60 seconds, making them a natural pest control solution. When it comes to hunting insects, bats have a unique advantage, echolocation. Emitting high-frequency sounds, they listen for the echoes that bounce back from their surroundings, allowing them to create a detailed acoustic map of their environment. This remarkable sonar system enables bats to precisely locate and intercept their insect prey, even in complete darkness. This plays a crucial ecological role in South Carolina's environment. By suppressing nocturnal insect populations, including crop pests, bats reduce the need for costly pesticides. A study conducted in 2011 estimated that bats save South Carolina's agricultural industry over $115 million each year in pest suppression services, contributing to a total of $22.9 billion saved annually for the United States as a whole. This natural pest control service provided by bats not only benefits farmers, but also helps maintain the delicate balance of ecosystems.
Unfortunately, these animals face many ecological threats despite their environmental services. Habitat loss and fragmentation have been a stressor for decades, if not centuries, as have toxicants and more recently, wind energy. One other major threat is white-nose syndrome, an insidious fungal pathogen that has wreaked havoc on bat populations across North America. Named for the distinctive white fungal growth that appears on the noses, wings, and bodies of affected bats, this disease is caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans. There are several methods in which the fungus that causes white nose syndrome can spread. Bats that come into contact with infected bats can contract the fungus. Additionally, the surfaces of the cave or hibernaculum can harbor the fungus. People can also unintentionally spread the fungus by it getting on their clothes, shoes, or gear and contaminating ecosystems. Since discovered in 2006, it's estimated that over 6 million bats have succumbed to this devastating disease, leading to population declines of several bat species and even pushing some to the brink of extinction. The fungus invades the bat's skin during hibernation, a state in which the bat's body temperatures, metabolic rates, and immune systems are greatly reduced. The fungus causes irritation, disturbed hibernation patterns, and increased energy expenditure. Infected bats often arouse prematurely from hibernation, depleting their fat reserves and leaving them vulnerable to starvation. Additional effects from the disease include wing damage, inability to regulate body temperature, breathing disruptions, and dehydration. This disease can take a severe toll possibly killing up to 100% of some bat colonies during hibernation, prompting some species to be listed in the Endangered Species Act. Recognizing the severity of the situation, conservation efforts have been mobilized to protect and save bat species. Biologists, researchers, and conservation organizations are actively involved in studying white nose syndrome, its impact on bat populations, and developing strategies to combat its spread. But in order to save bats, you have to go where the fight is. Nestled within the breathtaking landscapes of Oconee County, Stump House Tunnel stands as a testament to unfinished dreams of railroad glory. Originally intended as part of the Blue Ridge Railroad of South Carolina, this incomplete tunnel, located in the heart of Sumter National Forest, has taken on a new role as a haven for bats. For the last 10 years, a dedicated team of researchers from the U.S. Forest Service periodically don protective gear and venture into the tunnel's depths. They are here to conduct a survey on the tunnel's tricolored bat population, a threatened microbat species. Named for the distinct three-color pattern in their fur, tricolored bats are particularly susceptible to the disease here because the fungus thrives best between 50 and 58 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature range of Stump House Tunnel. This protective gear they're wearing isn't for their safety, but to help decrease the spread of the white nose syndrome fungus because this tunnel is white nose positive. The bat count involves meticulously documenting the numbers of tricolored bats within the tunnel, providing valuable insights into population dynamics and changes over time. Additionally, the researchers carefully swab the bats, collecting samples that are sent to a laboratory for analysis, specifically checking for the presence of the devastating white nose syndrome. The group also records crucial data measuring the bat's weight, temperature, and physical condition, all parameters that can be affected by white nose syndrome. This also includes using a black light to illuminate any histological damage to the wing that is characteristic of the disease. To aid in future studies, some bats are banded with unique identification numbers, allowing long-term monitoring.
Outside of this tunnel, other organizations are doing their part, aiding in essential research. Since 2017, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources has been conducting their own surveys on bat populations. Their unique method of obtaining specimens is called bat netting. This process involves setting up specialized equipment to safely capture bats for research. Using acoustic devices to detect and analyze bat noises, SCDNR biologists identify potential roosting sites and flight paths. Then, once a good location has been determined, they set up 30-foot aluminum poles and stretch a thin net across a suitable path. As bats navigate their usual flight routes, some inadvertently fly into the net and become tangled. The captured bats are then carefully untangled from the net and go through a series of assessments, checking their size, weight, and of course, to see if they have been infected with white nose syndrome. Additionally, the bat's salivary glands, called buccals, are checked by lightly blowing air into their mouths with a bulb syringe. As of now, very little research has been conducted on swollen buccal glands in the United States, so wildlife biologists are trying to determine what species have the swollen glands. After all necessary data has been collected, the bats are promptly released back into the wild, ensuring minimal disturbance to their natural behavior and habitats. But organizations like SCDNR and the U.S. Forest Service aren't the only ones lending a helping hand. Meet John Gillespie, a passionate bat enthusiast also known as the Batman of Traveler's Rest. When he's not actively volunteering with bat counts across the state, John can be found in his workshop, dedicating his time and skills to crafting bat boxes. To him, it's all about doing what he can to save the bats. With meticulous care, he handcrafts durable rocket boxes that provide comfortable and safe roosting spaces. John's bat boxes are designed with a keen understanding of bats' needs. They're insulated and feature multiple chambers, allowing bats to move within the box to find their desired temperature. This thoughtful design ensures that the bats have optimal conditions for roosting and reproduction. Funding for the materials is provided by donations, people who want a box of their own, or from John's own pocket. Some boxes are even made for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, who utilize them in their heritage preserves and parks across the state. These carefully crafted boxes contribute to the conservation efforts of SCDNR, providing additional roosting options for bats while simultaneously fueling their ongoing research. This box here was specifically made to attract northern long-eared bats, one that's facing extinction because of white-nose syndrome. The hope is some will travel further south and make John's box their home. It's through dedicated work like this that these remarkable creatures stand a fighting chance to survive and stay wild. Can't get enough of what's wild? Go to SCETV.org for more exciting episodes of South Carolina Wildlife. Also, be sure to visit our Facebook and Instagram page at South Carolina ETV to let us know what other plants or animals you'd like to see next. From everyone at South Carolina ETV, I'm Desiree Cheeks, and thanks for watching, and remember to stay wild.